Cardinals get back to their winning ways on Sunday, but was Mason Wynn an all-star snub? What's going on, everyone, and welcome in to this edition of B-Shafe Daily. Brendan Schaefer here with you. Sunday evening, July 7th, 2024. That Cardinals game much better than the one we talked about this morning, huh? And the audio quality is so much better now, too. You can scroll back if you want to hear me talk Lance Lynn and his rough outing from Saturday, as well as a preview of kind of where our headspace is as far as potential trade endeavors for the Cardinals in the coming weeks. But we're going to talk about a Cardinals win in this episode of the show as the Redbirds bounce back, as they've often seemed to do over the last month or so, an 8-3 to three win on Sunday afternoon at Nationals Park in Washington, D.C. I heard it asked as one of the questions in the postgame to Ollie Marmel, the notion that the Cardinals have not lost consecutive games more than maybe just once in the past month or so. That's not something that I vetted, but just heard a reporter mention it to Ollie Marmel after the game. The fact that they haven't been, when they lose one, and it might be a bad one like it was Saturday, they don't let that linger. They've done a very nice job of turning the page to the next day and avoiding those losing skids. I feel like it's ever since they had the seven-game losing streak, it's been very rare to see the Cardinals lose a number of games in a row. They have some bad games, certainly from time to time, but they've been able to stem the tide otherwise and keep it within that one day and then turn around the next day and play pretty well. The Cardinals played pretty well this afternoon, getting the 8-3 to three win. So we'll talk about that on this episode of B-Shape Daily, as well as the news of the All-Star Game rosters coming out Sunday night. Cardinals do have an All-Star because every team has one, and it's Ryan Helsley, but should the Cardinals have had maybe more than one? And was Mason Wynn a guy that deserved a longer look and more consideration than he ultimately seemed to have received? I'll give you the numbers. I know that this is one that if you just look at wins above replacement, if you just look at OPS, you might look at it and say, well, Mason Wynn's not really near the top of those categories, so stands to reason that, uh, no, he wasn't snubbed. It was deserving candidates that made it instead of him. I'll just go ahead and give you some of the numbers, though, that I think Mason Wynn probably should have gotten more consideration because of some of the ranks that he holds among all MLB shortstops and particularly in the National League. So we'll talk about that tonight on the show. And as always, you can get your comments in on where your headspace is at when it comes to trade conversations and how involved the Cardinals need to be in them because this is the month of those types of discussions. Trade deadline is just around the corner, about three weeks away. How active will the Cardinals be, and how active do you want to see them be? Well, you can let us know in the comments below right here on YouTube, and you can also subscribe to the channel if you want daily Cardinals conversation. If you want to wake up every day and know that you've got a recap in your inbox from the night before, uh, that's really where this channel comes into play, covering every single Cardinals game in a YouTube video and in a podcast, as well as now we're going to continue to get into the trade stuff because I know that that is uh, the most wonderful time of the year for a lot of baseball fans wanting to know what's the scuttlebutt, what could the Cardinals do, what should they do. We'll digest some of the news as it comes about, some of the reporting, some of the rumors is all going to be fair game here on the channel. So if you like that kind of stuff, subscribe and consider a channel membership as well if you really want to take your support of the YouTube channel to the next level. Uh, We added within the last day or so another channel member that I wanted to make sure to shout out. Sean H. has joined the channel as a member, so appreciate you, Sean. Thanks for being along for the ride, as well as all of our other awesome channel members. Monday, I do plan to get this going as I look to set up a Discord channel where we can have a private group chat involving some of the folks from the membership. That is something that I am imminently going to try to tackle on Monday, and if I don't, you got to hold me to it in the comments on YouTube because I know that's something that some channel members have been saying would be pretty cool for a while, so we're going to try to give that a go and see if I can't tackle the technology involved in that whole deal, and uh, continue to just expand what we offer here. So appreciate you guys for joining me. Enough about that. Let's go ahead and get into this. As the Cardinals, well, we could start with the game or we could start with the All-Star stuff. Let's start with the All-Star stuff because that's top of mind and then stick around for the game conversation as we will get into it. And and some of it will bleed into the other because what I really want to focus is on Mason Wynn and the idea that he did not get considered as an All-Star. But I want to also explain like how that comes to be and how the selection process is done, because for some people that may still not be a a point of clarity for some baseball fans of like, okay, exactly why is Ryan Helsley an all-star? Who decided that? And who decided that it wouldn't be Mason Wynn? As many baseball fans do know, all MLB teams are going to have a representative in the game. But the way that comes to fruition is if you don't have a representative that is voted in as an all-star starter, which the fans are responsible for that voting process, 
and you don't have anybody voted in via the player vote, which is a number of the pitchers for both teams as well as some of the reserves on the benches as far as the position players are concerned. Once those two steps of the process have been completed, MLB goes through the teams that has not been granted a representative at that point, and they pick somebody. And in the case of the Cardinals, Ryan Helsley was selected by MLB because no Cardinal was voted in as a starter, and no Cardinal received that level of consideration in the vote that is run by the players on their balloting. And so MLB had to step in and say, here's your token all-star Cardinals. And the Cardinals are far from the only team that this happened to, but it is something that it feels a little bit notable. I saw it posted on Twitter earlier today in, in reaction, obviously, to the All-Star announcements. A picture of all the Cardinals back in 2013 that were on a, a private jet flying out to the All-Star game. It was Yachty. It was Wainwright. It was Alan Craig. It was Matt Carpenter. It was Edward Mujica and... It was Carlos Beltran. I think I remember everybody that was in that picture, but it was like a hugely impressive number of players for the Cardinals that were voted in as All-Stars or were however the process is, right? Player vote, fan vote, selection, later on as injury replacements, whatever the case would be. The Cardinals had a lot of representation in that 2013 game. That's 11 years ago. It's been a long time. Not too normal to just compare it direct to direct, but it is just interesting to think about. The Cardinals at one point definitely were used to being accustomed to having a lot of representation. And right now it's like, all right, MLB is going to give you one because that's the way that it works. Now that doesn't mean Ryan Helsley's not deserved. Of course he is. Leads MLB in saves 31 out of 33. And the two times he didn't convert on those save opportunities, he ended up getting the win in the game. The first time against the Dodgers, maybe not so deservedly, because just did it by virtue of completing that ninth inning and the Cardinals scored in the 10th. I think Gallegos actually got the save in that game. That was all the way back in March. But then Friday night, Ryan Helsley loses the save streak on the Ghost Runner, the Manfred Man, and proceeds to pitch a scoreless 11th inning to get the win. Cardinals win the game. Those are his two blown saves on the season. Ryan Helsley ends up getting the win in both of them. 2.41 2.41 ERA, 47 strikeouts in 41 innings. Helsley is a deserving all-star, no doubt about it. But it's just the feeling that, well, MLB said you had to have one, so that's the pick. That sort of that sort of thing. And I, I think this has been something that's been building for a little bit for the Cardinals, where you realize that the star power on this team is not necessarily performing at the expectation level. If you talk about the highest paid talent, guys like Goldie, guys like Arenado, they're not meeting expectations at this point in the year. A little bit more than halfway through the year, so a pretty good size of the sample as far as what to maybe expect moving forward. We have seen Arenado really begin to turn the corner again recently. Still not doing a ton in the way of power, but uh, getting on base more, getting more base hits, and the batting average starting to tick up. But that's really where you expect to see some all-star caliber names like and I know the fan vote is something that is not really the end-all be-all because, well, if fans don't vote you in, you're not in as far as the starters are concerned, and that's not really the fault of the player or his numbers. But Cardinals fans, I think, would be on board for stuff in the ballot box on some guys that are deserving of it, but the Cardinals just have not had that. And Maybe it would have been Wilson Contreras this year if not for the injury because his numbers certainly stacked up pretty well against other National League catchers, but... As it was, you had just Ryan Helsley. I wanted to talk a little bit, though, about Mason Wynn. First of all, what an unbelievable double play turn that he had with Nolan Gorman today in the Cardinals' 8-3 win as he gloved it and then flipped it, only had time to flip it with the glove, couldn't go to the bare hand and try to flip it to Nolan Gorman and flipped it perfectly. Gorman, with a strong arm through from second, got the double play completed. Just incredible stuff, and that's where, like, to me, boils down to on Mason Wynn, you could make a case that he's a deserving all-star candidate because his defense absolutely should play a role in that level of consideration. And I put out a tweet with some of these numbers, and it garnered some attention. There is some arguing going on in the comments, which I just didn't really care to get into. When it comes to all-star stuff, like about a lot of things, award voting, you could, you, you want to be objective with the numbers and there are maybe not as many ways that people view to look at it when it comes to MVP or Cy Young. 
you want to know the, the the mainstay statistics and who's doing the best in those stats. And in that case, I'll definitely give a a, a war wins above replacement argument some credence. You could make the argument with all star voting as well if you wanted to. It's it's not bad to do so. I just think you can look at all star a little bit differently because it's about highlighting the most sometimes interesting personalities of the game, but also the performance has to dictate. Mason wins wins above replacement is not as high as a lot of the shortstops. I don't know exactly where he ranks, but it's not in a range that you would say, oh, he should have been an all-star. He was a snub. But a few of the things do stand out about Mason Wynn. I tweeted this out. These stats and where he ranks among National League shortstops this season. Batting average is second among NL shortstops at 294. On-base percentage is third at 343. And the big one that I think is interesting, defensive runs saved. He has 10 defensive runs saved which leads all MLB shortstops and is tied for third among all MLB position players in defensive runs saved. Now, if you look at some other corporations, other companies and their entities and the statistics they like to use, outs above average is one that is put together by StatCast. Or I, I've gotten in trouble by doing this wrong or saying this wrong in the past. I see it on StatCast's website. I Frankly, I don't necessarily care who puts it together. It's on StatCast's website. You can't find defensive runs saved for me anyway unless I go to fan graphs. Let me know if there's a, a better way of doing that. But I see it on StatCast website, the baseball savant, and Mason Wynn does not rank nearly as favorably in that stat. Just for full disclosure, outs above average, he's right around average, whereas defensive runs saved, he is just far and away the best MLB shortstop defensively. Ten defensive runs saved. Outs above average, for whatever it's worth, really likes Michael Ciani which why wouldn't you if you've seen him play defense? He's, he does a really nice job, but he leads like he's tied for all of MLB in terms of outs above average, which is uh, I think Marcus Simeon is who he's tied with with 13. Mesa wins got like one. He might even be a negative one. So clearly our defensive metrics and the different companies that put them together are going to have some disagreement. And there is a, a hot debate, I'm sure, among many people who dive right into that stuff about which is preferred, and this one's bunk, and this one's good. I don't really care. I just wanted to highlight a few of the things that I thought, you know what, Mason Wynn, top three in OBP, second in batting average. Uh, clearly, somebody thinks he's doing something right with a defensive run saved, and if you watch him day in and day out, you see that. I will say the errors, you know, everybody's going to make errors. We talked about that previously on the podcast, but the number of errors that he's made on plays that, I don't know if routine is the right word, but just plays that definitely should be made. That's been a hallmark. It's been a part of Mason Wynn's game at times this year that you'd like to see him eradicate. But the defensive run saved metric is an interesting one. And he does rate very favorably in that one. So just a few things. Like, you could look at L.A. De La Cruz, and he ends up getting to go to the All-Star game. He gets the nod as an injury replacement for Mookie Betts. And Mookie Betts, I guess, was the top uh, selection according to the player vote. And then with Mookie obviously being on the IL, somebody has to come in and take his place. Ellie De La Cruz was the next ranked shortstop on the player vote. And if you look at Ellie's numbers, I tweeted this as well. I didn't want to make it an either-or comparison because I think Ellie De La Cruz is, plays right into that notion of, you know what, all-star game, I look at a little bit more than just wins above replacement. I'm okay with having a little extra pizzazz in the all-star game and letting the guy's personality and play style shine through. I just happen to think that both Ellie De La Cruz and Mason Wynn qualify in that regard. Uh, I I think both those guys have have that type of uh, pizzazz to them, that extra flair for the dramatic. They both can make the eye-popping play, both with the throwing arm. uh, Ellie certainly more so with the power, and it's undeniable what De La Cruz has done from a stolen base perspective this year. 43 steals already on the season. He saw what Ronald Acuna did last year and said, well, maybe I could, maybe I could have my run at putting together an eye popping stolen base total. And you think of the, the all time greats like Lou Brock and and Ricky Henderson. Uh, Last year, it was a 40 home run, 70 stolen base season for Ronald Acuna jr. And Ellie De La Cruz said, all right, let me give, let me, let me try my hand at that. He's not going to get to 40 on homers, but he, he'll certainly have a shot at a 30, 70, or maybe even a 30, 80, season with the number of stolen bases that he's put together. But Elliot De La Cruz has also struck out 121 times, and that's not really something you penalize people for when you're talking all-star. Mason Wynn, just 60 strikeouts. He's only got nine stolen bra- uh, bases. 
and you just look at the numbers, and OPS is going to be an edge toward Ellie De La Cruz. So I'm not, I wasn't trying to make it either or, but he was kind of the shortstop that I thought would, would be on that line because he was only added as an injury replacement. Uh, C.J. Abrams was added as well by MLB for the Washington Nationals to be able to have a representative, and of course the Cardinals will get to see him one more time on Monday afternoon as the Cardinals wrap up that series in D.C., but I was just kind of comparing some of the numbers. I get it. Home runs are going to carry the day more often than not when it comes to all-star and and power production is going to matter. And OPS is a very good statistic. I really like the stat, and Elliot De La Cruz is better in it than Mason Wynn. But Mason Wynn, batting average on base, has, has got an edge on both of those categories as of the moment over Elliot De La Cruz. And I just thought when you add in the defensive reputation and the the eye popping play, Mason Wynn stacks up pretty favorably there. But it, you know, it is what it is. It's not the end of the world. I saw some commentary of people saying, you know, I'd like to see Mason Wynn get to rest and, and be ready for the second half of the season. Anyway, I just think it was an honor that could have been considered for. Not surprised that he didn't get it because again, the Cardinals didn't have anybody voted in. MLB had to pick Ryan Helsley. I think if you lead the league in saves, uh, there's going to be a few closers as always that get consideration for All Star candidacy I think Ryan Helsley is a very viable choice you could have made a case well was Sonny Gray close to being on that line maybe not quite has not pitched as well recently I'm not sure quite when they had to make these decisions by they were obviously announced on Sunday but what do you think Cardinals fans was Mason Wynn snubbed I I put that in the title to the video because I did want to kind of start up that conversation but I also think it's very reasonable to be able to look at all of the uh, the evidence and say well maybe he wasn't snubbed but just that I think it's worth a discussion and a conversation about how much his candidacy should have been uh, considered. And I think Mason Wynn's put together a really nice start to the season, good first half. Can he continue it and potentially be in the running for Rookie of the Year consideration? I think there's definitely a possibility that he could be in that race. When you if, you, if you're going to factor in what he's done offensively, he's now performing as the Cardinals' leadoff man. Um, that's a pretty big deal and is doing a nice job scoring a bunch of runs. You know, I, I think that Mason Wynn certainly is somebody that should be getting a little bit of attention for the season that he's had. And if it's not going to come in the form of an all-star candidacy, that's okay. But I wanted to know what Cardinals fans thought of that. Certainly, he helped the Cardinals out in the win on Sunday. So now that we've kind of uh, beaten the dead horse a little bit on uh, was there an all-star snub, kind of hard to say for a Cardinals team that's not in first place. Uh, they have been playing with one of the best records in baseball since around Mother's Day but they're only five games above 500, and they really haven't done it with with a lot of notoriety or star power. I guess the other aspect of it that I would want to mention as it pertains to the all-star discussion before really diving into today's game, uh, which in so doing, I'm bringing up somebody who performed really well in today's game. Wilson Contreras has a 928 OPS, and he hit another home run today, had three RBIs in the game, and has basically picked up right where he left off back when he had that injury in early May, missed the better part of six, seven weeks, and has come right back into the fold and is doing a marvelous job for the Cardinals, the heartbeat of this offense, effectively. He's got a 928 OPS, and when you look at the catchers that were selected for the All-Star game, he's better than them. Wilson Contreras has better numbers, but he hasn't played in nearly as many games. Wilson Contreras has played in 44 games. His brother, William Contreras, was voted into the all-star game as the starter. And then it was Will Smith that was added a little bit later on as the player vote took place. And I think those are the only two catchers on the all-star roster. If I'm missing one, somebody correct me, but I'm just kind of scrolling through the press release from MLB real quick. Uh, Will Smith deserving. I mean, he's got 15 home runs, 845 OPS, a 500 slug. William Contreras, his OPS is above 800 He's got a nearly 300 batting average, really having a nice season uh, there for the Milwaukee Brewers. But Wilson Contreras, I do like OPS. And again, I I understand that I'm arguing maybe against OPS in the case of Mason Wynn to say, yeah, as as much as his OPS is not otherworldly, I think it's like 759, there are other aspects for me that would apply with Mason Wynn. But, I mean, if you just want to go with the standard argument, Wilson Contreras, I mean, he's slugging 529, leads all catchers. 928 OPS leads all catchers. Talking about NL catchers, you look at some of the other big names. You know, J2 Real Muto was not named to an all star team, which uh, he's been to plenty of them, but a 720 OPS. 
Wilson's just got better numbers than everybody except for the home runs with, with his brother William and with Will Smith. But those guys have played in 87 and, and 75 games, respectively. Wilson has played in 44 games. He's got nine home runs, just 21 RBIs. But the rate stats are very, very good for Wilson. He's played about half of the team's eligible games. Basically, the argument would be, well, Trey Turner is in kind of a similar situation, but he was voted in by the fans as the all-star starter, uh, hitting 340 with a 383 on base and a 505 slug. I'm, I'm looking at that on baseball reference, so that may not be updated as far as Trey Turner's numbers are concerned. But he's played in like 50, 51 games compared to Wilson's played in 40, I believe 44 as of now. So that would be the one thing is like, did Wilson just barely maybe fall below the threshold that he would be considered? You know, how how does it end up looking if you go, and again, the players voted this in, so it wasn't like MLB selected Will Smith and said, yeah, that he needs to be the backup catcher on the team. It, it was a case of the players voting, and, and they probably kind of out of sight, out of mind by the time the voting actually took place. I don't know exactly when, probably in June, that that takes place, maybe toward the end of June. It may be that Contreras wasn't even quite back yet for the Cardinals, so I, I'm not 100% sure what goes into that. But just looking at it, like Wilson's played a handful fewer games than Trey Turner. Trey Turner was voted in by the fans, so that would maybe be the differential as to why Contreras was not ultimately considered uh, even though the numbers, at least from a rate perspective, uh, were certainly valid, and if he had play, if he had not been hurt, I think there's no doubt about it that Wilson Contreras would have been an All Star, as long as he kept up the numbers that he was putting together, which he's since done. He missed seven weeks almost, and he came right back, and it's like nothing changed. So that's maybe the one disappointment is that if Wilson Contreras had been healthy the whole way, and JD Martinez's swing had not broken his left catching arm we'd be probably talking about Wilson Contreras as an all-star, but maybe in that case, not Ryan Helsley because he was selected by MLB. So would the Cardinals have still only had one? Would there have been a decision to maybe by the players to put a reliever on there that wasn't otherwise? I, I don't have any idea. Checking out the NL pitchers who were selected by the player ballot. Tyler Glass, now Ronaldo Lopez, Chris Sale, Ranger Suarez, Zach Wheeler, the relievers, from the player ballot were all Phillies, weirdly enough. No, two Phillies and a Padre, it looks like. Jeff Hoffman, who's had a really nice season. Matt Strom and Robert Suarez of the Padres. So, it's interesting, man. The The, the fans voted like crazy for Phillies, and now we're, we're seeing that the players did the same thing. wonder how they stacked it that way. But nevertheless, Ryan Helsley, maybe he wouldn't have been if, if Wilson Contreras was, and I think Helsley is certainly deserving. Saves are not the end-all be-all, but if you talk about, if you talk to players, I mean, they really value those those stats, and pitcher wins are, are valued, I think, by the players more so than they are fans and media nowadays because got, those guys are like, well, that's the whole point, right? Win the game. So there is that bottom-line mentality when it comes to players that maybe doesn't get addressed as much in terms of the way we view it from the outside, but I'll tell you what, pitchers still value wins, and you can bet your life that closers still value saves and know that that is a, an important statistic in the bottom line of what it ha- what it means for an MLB team throughout a season. So Ryan Helsley deserving. I think Contreras, there's an argument to have been made, but maybe didn't play enough games. And then in the case of Mason Wynn, uh, the, the traditional stats that people value, home runs, OPS, slugging percentage, maybe not quite as much in that regard as some of the other candidates. But I do think Mason Wynn, deserving of the conversation at least so hey we had it and now we'll move on let me know your thoughts though in the comments if you have them about mason Wynn, about Contreras, about whatever else um sunny gray I, I, that one feels a little bit more easy to stomach with the recent uh downturn in his performance but there was a time certainly when he thought he we thought he might have been a pretty viable candidate as a cardinal all-star let's talk about sunday's game a little bit though eight to three the cardinals got the win uh, really, really nice game from the offense. This might have been one of the better games of the season from the Cardinal offense, and I'm not like grading that against who the pitcher was. Uh, DJ Hers was the uh, the young pitcher for Washington that the Cardinals eventually were able to get to and chase him from the game. But just the reason I say one of the most impressive games offensively of the season is the quality of at bats the Cardinals were taking. How many times today did they go from an 0-2 count to finding a way to work the count full or to work it to at least 2-2 and get the starter to throw more pitches. I think ultimately at the end of the day, that's what the Cardinals should be valuing and should be doing as an offense. If they're not going to beat you with homers, 
that's kind of the way that you you can find a way to beat teams is, hey, we might not be able to, to do long ball as often as some of the other teams, which this year the Cardinals haven't. And that makes sense when you have guys like Goldie and Arenado that you expect 30 homers from, and they're not pacing nearly, nearly toward a 30 home run mark. So, and Noah Gorman has hit homers, but has not done a lot else. Like, you have to figure out other ways to do it, I think, if you're the Cardinals in 2024. And it's a credit to the team that they were able to do it today. Uh, get to a Nationals bullpen that's a little bit more mediocre. Uh, 4.09 ERA this season for the Nats bullpen. And obviously the Cardinals still get to face them one more day in the series with the, the series extending into Monday. So because of all those things, felt pretty good for the Cardinals to be able to work the starter as much as they did. Uh, he threw 102 pitches, which was a new career high for him. Only has made seven or eight starts on the year. But that was 102 pitches unable to even complete the fifth inning for DJ Herr. So I thought the Cardinals just took really good at bats today and they kept with it and stuck with it over the course of multiple innings, which is another factor that sometimes we don't always see with the Cardinals. They might have a crooked number or two and some days that could be good enough. They might score five runs out of that. But today was a different circumstance when in four of the first seven innings, the Cardinals were able to put up runs. Three of those were crooked number innings and that's how you get to eight and they do so with the, the benefit of 13 hits on the day. Also reach base via walk three different times. That's enough base runners to do damage, and the Cardinals did today. Four for 11 with Risp. You feel very good about that. You're always going to leave some guys on base. They had nine left on base in the game today, but just really feel good all the way around about the quality of at-bats and the number of different contributors as well, as everybody who started in this game got at least one hit, and that's not something that you're always able to say about the Cardinals. We've heard the notion of one through nine, something that Ali Marmel has mentioned, but how often has it really been one through nine? You kind of say one through nine, but then you look and go, okay, a couple of the guys that you really do need to get them going still aren't really making it happen. But I think today was a little bit of a different instance of that where the Cardinals did get some consistency top to bottom. We'll roll through it. Mason win. I mentioned one for four with a run scored. Also reached base via walk and had that darling defensive play, uh, the double play that he turned with Nolan Gorman. Uh, Alec Burleson continues to do a nice job. He was two for three, scored a run. We mentioned Wilson Contreras had another big day and just plopping him right back into the middle of the order. There's no obvious candidate other than Contreras to bat third for this team. And I like that the Cardinals are kind of morphing and, and changing and shaping the lineup as it needs to be as the year goes along. They've realized at this point Mason wins probably their best bet to lead off, which then naturally slots in Burleson, who's been their most effective lefty bat. He can go into the number two spot with Contreras batting third. From there, they still have some things, I think, to work on because Brendan Donovan doesn't really profile as a cleanup hitter, but it would be nice to maybe have the lefty bat going up that far. I don't know why he doesn't profile as it, though, when he's a guy leading the team in RBIs or, or right among the, the team leader in RBIs. And today didn't have one, but he reached base twice. I think the more he bats, the better for the Cardinals. And so I wouldn't hesitate. I would be separating Goldsmith and Arenado generally. I almost think, though, that they've got it the wrong way. They, they might have to flip Goldie and Arenado and have Arenado be the first righty bat of the two and have Goldie be the guy that they move down a little bit further. He was one for five today, but he's hitting 226 with a 651 OPS on the season. I just think that Arenado's actually been taking better at bats than Goldschmidt, and the numbers bear that out. I What do you think, Cardinals fans, of maybe just switching those two? Like wh I understood it. When it used to be like Goldie would bat third, Arenado would bat fourth, and that's why they would be in that order because Arenado kind of preferred and, and would be not as shy about saying, like, I I enjoy being the cleanup man. I identify as being a cleanup man, and that's something that works for him. And so for the longest time, that was just kind of the way that it was. I almost wonder if just to shake something loose, if maybe you switch them around and see if that doesn't jar anything for these guys. Which Arenado, by the way, I don't think you're in the current process of having to jar anything loose for him because his numbers have been a lot better recently. And he was two for five today with a couple of RBIs, and and you're starting to see the numbers tick back up. He's hitting 270. OPS is over 700, not by much, but it's better than not being there. And you can look over the recent stretch for Arenado. I mean, last seven games, he's hitting 345 on base at a 387 clip. The slug isn't there. The, the on base is actually higher than the slug. Last 15 games, he's slugging 373, which is not, you know, what, what you're normally going to be expecting Nolan Arenado to be. But his on base is near 350, and he's hitting over 300 over his last 15 games. 
and then you can extend it even further. This is a 113 at bat sample size, but over his last 30 games, he's hitting 292 with a 344 on base. That is very Nolan Arenado esque. Uh, it's quite good, in fact. Sometimes doesn't even have the batting average that high for a, a good number of his seasons. But the slug is 381 over the past 30 games. Just two home runs in that stretch. That's really all you're missing at this point for Arenado, and it's kind of inexplicable. But everything else he's doing a nice job with. And the the differential between that and what you're getting from Paul Goldschmidt is such that I don't even think I can talk about it in terms of like, hey, maybe they should. No, like definitively Goldschmidt needs to be moved down. And he needs to be moved out of an RBI producing spot. Uh, over the last 30 games, he's hitting 234, has some slug at 363, but I would almost take the guy that's getting on base at a 350 clip in that span and put him a little higher in the lineup, which is Arenado, than have Goldie where he's been. Because as much as Paul Goldschmidt, and it's not, I'm not trying to rail on him or rip on him, but the numbers are the numbers at this point in 2024. He has been, and I got this uh, DM from Damian, who's one of our channel subscribers, channel uh, members, I should say. And he said to me that Goldschmidt has got to be the worst hitter with runners in scoring position in the big leagues. And I was like, well, I know he's had a rough year of, of leaving ducks on the pond, but that seems a little bit harsh. But let's go ahead and look it up. So I did, and Damian actually was not far off in terms of saying that Goldie is is got to be the worst player in baseball with risk this year. Orlando Arcia is actually the worst with a 121 batting average, which is really not good. Goldie is at a 160 batting average, though, with RISP and has had a ton of opportunities because he's batting cleanup more times than not. 81 at bats. He's 13 for 81, one homer, one double, 27 strikeouts. Hit 160 with a 210 slug and a 269 on base with RISP. Yeah, it's been about as bad as anybody in baseball this year. So, can Paul Goldschmidt come around? I do think that he can. Do the Cardinals need to continue batting Paul Goldschmidt cleanup? No. It, you could argue that he was, is one of the least uh, capable cleanup men in baseball this year because the job is, hey, those first three guys are going to get on base for you. you got to drive them in. you got to clean up. And Goldie has just been the opposite of that. It, 226 overall batting average but even worse with risk, and that's where batting average actually does count. You can argue, well, how much does average matter? Shouldn't we be looking at other stats nowadays? Sure, but with risk, batting average is the most important stat because are you getting the hit that's going to drive in the run or multiple runs? Yes or no. In the case of Goldie this year, it's been no, and he's hitting 160 with risk. So I would move Arenado up to Goldschmidt's spot, put Arenado clean up, actually. And Goldie, I would separate Goldie and Arenado maybe. I would put Donovan up to five, and I would put Goldie down to six. I think would be the way to do it right now. And then that kind of flows very nicely with what's going on for Nolan Gorman, who had another nice day, two for four. He's swinging the bat well, had a couple of RBIs, also reached base via walk, and you're feeling pretty good about that. Had a double in this game. Nolan Gorman's got his batting average up to 206. He's OPSing 705. It's not life-changing, but it is vastly different from what we had been seeing from Nolan Gorman the previous couple of weeks. Last seven games, he's hitting 391, slugging 652, on bases at 417. That's an OPS of over 1,000, close to 1,100 over the last week or so. But the last 15 games, you see that dive hitting 239 with a 370 slug over the last 15 games. It's almost been immediately within the last week that Gorman has shifted back into gear over his last 30 games, even with that torrid pace over the last seven, the 30-game pace, which is over 100 ABs, he's hitting 155 with a 272 slug. So it's been recent. Has it been enough? I keep saying every day that Nolan Gorman gets a multi-hit game and is on base multiple times. I keep saying, ah, don't move him up yet. Don't move him up yet. Well, the reason I'm saying don't move him up yet now is because I think you have a really good one through seven with guys feeling good and maybe not needing to change too much of it. The only thing is moving down Goldschmidt. And the reason for it, I think, is because I think it's a little bit overrated when people say, oh, this guy's so unclutch. I, I think that's maybe a, a mischaracterization. This year, Goldie has been unclutch. The numbers bear that out. If you're hitting 160 with RISP, there's only one guy in baseball that's been worse with RISP. I think you probably need to recognize that 
cleanup is maybe not the best spot for Goldie at this point in time. Whereas Arenado, look, if those guys are, are Burleson and Contreras are getting on base with singles and doubles and maybe homers in front of you, and you don't need to worry about driving them in if, if they're going to do it themselves, it's fine. But Arenado at least has been getting on base at a pretty nice clip recently. So if, if you've got a guy in scoring position and he gets a single, that's going to play. And he's been more inclined to be able to come up with that than Goldie at this point. So I, I, the Cardinals are as close as you can be maybe to having that lineup look like you want it to look for the long haul. If you go win Burleson, Contreras, that's, that's your right, left, right. You stack two righties at one point if you have to. You can do that with Contreras and Arenado at three and four. And then you can go back to the lefty Donovan at five. He's been an RBI fiend for this team. I have no problem with him being in the five hole. And I think ever since they moved him back down to six, I'm kind of like, all right, I kind of liked him at five. And this is all very nitpicky, but we do a daily podcast. We're going to talk about it, try to figure out the lineup stuff. It's fun for people. I have fun with it. I just don't want to make too much of it, more of it than what it is. But if you go Contreras, Arenado three, four, Donovan five, Goldie down to sixth, then Gorman seven, then you have to figure out, well, now Lars Newpar's coming back. So how do you, maybe that throws a, a wrench into the entire thing. But without Newpar, I think it's honestly kind of perfect because then you can go, Pajes, if he happens to be in here like he was today, can be eighth, and then maybe Siani ninth, and that can get you the, the right, left, right that you're looking for basically everywhere except for the 3-4 combination, which Contreras Arenado is perfectly suitable in that spot. When you get Lars Newpar back and you want him batting in the top four, you're again looking at somebody with maybe not the profile for a prototypical cleanup man, but I don't really think the prototype matters at, at this point because what they're getting from Goldschmidt is just not consistent enough. Well, it's consistently bad. Hitting 160 with Risp, move him down. Move him down to six, maybe even below. I wouldn't have an issue with that. It seemed to work for Gorman. They moved him down, and then a little bit later, suddenly he's sparking something, and maybe they're able to ride that. So we'll see. Uh, but that's my lineup so, uh, lineup thoughts for the day. Let me know if you have any. Dylan Carlson had a base hit, one for five, had an RBI as well. Pajes was batting ninth, and he was one for four in the game. So everybody did end up getting a hit that started, which was kind of cool to see. All right, looking to wrap things up, though, here pretty shortly. Wanted to touch on the performance by Kyle Gibson. Where did this come from that Kyle Gibson is such a strikeout merchant? I mean, this has not really been the story of his career but we know the sweeper is, is good for Kyle Gibson, and the slider had been his go-to pitch throughout his career. It's talked about learning it back when he was at Mizzou back in the day and has really integrated the sweeper a little bit more. Maybe is that helping with his ability to, to miss bats the way that he has this year? I mean, it's becoming a sort of thing that it's not just a, an aberration. He is darn close at this point to averaging a strikeout per inning on the season. He came into today. Let me see. 97 and two-thirds innings with 93 strikeouts. So he's only four or five short of having that nine per nine, that one strikeout per inning pitched label. And he gained on himself by three because he had five innings pitched, but eight strikeouts today. So he's up over 100 strikeouts now on the year. I never would have pegged Kyle Gibson coming into the year as a guy that would average a strikeout per inning, but he's basically doing it at this point. So really impressive from him. And, you know, gave up some hits. Had nine hits allowed, walked a couple guys, was pitching around constant traffic all game, but you can kind of afford to do that when you're striking out guys at the rate that Kyle Gibson is doing it. So, uh, you know, this was a start that could have been better for him, but you get the run support, and then by virtue of that run support being there, they try to run him out for the additional inning in the sixth, and it doesn't end up working out. That's probably not something that Ollie Marmel does if the score doesn't dictate it at the time because the Cardinals were ahead in the game 6-2. to two. So they bring Kyle Gibson back out to begin the sixth inning. He does not end up recording any outs in the sixth. Gives up an additional run there to make his outing a little bit worse. Uh, could have been even worse than that, though. Ryan Fernandez came in, did a nice job, was able to get that double play that I alluded to earlier when it comes to Mason Wynn to Nolan Gorman. That was on Juan Yepes, by the way. He had a double in the game. I knew he would end up having a pretty decent series former Cardinal playing against his former team makes a lot of sense. But I think as it pertains to Ali Marmol giving the veteran Kyle Gibson that sixth, it's not something that happens in the types of situations that we have seen other guys replaced at times this year. Sonny Gray, it's happened with. Miles Michaels, it's happened with. Closer games, a lot of times, there's been the shorter hook. 
I think this was a scenario where they were going to let Kyle Gibson pitch to the score a little bit, but he ended up allowing the first three base runners, I think, in that sixth inning before they pulled him. And you'd like to see him be able to get through that spot. This was a rare example where Gibson was not able to, but I, I saw a good tweet. It was sent out by the STL Cards Fan 4. I've followed him for a long time. He said, don't want to hear about Marmel taking starters out too early after this game. This is why he does that, because third time through the order, sometimes starters just can't get guys out. And I'm not saying Marmel was wrong to leave Gibson in the game. Cardinals had the four-run cushion, and they needed the innings. But when they don't need the innings, the bullpen usually is stronger than the starter at that point. So I thought that was a good tweet. The cards, the SCL cards fan four. He had a good point with that one because you may not have been thinking, oh, Ollie Marmel should pull Kyle Gibson right now. Four run lead going into the six, try to squeeze one more out of him. Honestly, it was probably the perfect time to do that. But I think Marmel does try to cater to the score and to the game situation of when he's willing to push a little bit further and when he thinks it's time to go to the bullpen, which is typically, even though we have talked about overuse and, and, and heavy tax on the bullpen this year, typically that bullpen is going to be more fresh than the starter that's entering in through the third time of a batting order and and all the things that are associated with that. So kind of thought that was interesting, but as far as Gibby goes, man, pitched through some trouble today because of his ability to miss some bats and strike guys out. Eight strikeouts once again. He's got up over 100 strikeouts now on the season at 101. Yeah, didn't really see that coming, but the Cardinals – We'll certainly take it. Fernandez was good. Uh, John King was was good. And Roycroft, rock solid since he returned. You can't send him back to Memphis. You just can't do it. It's it's a shame he had to spend a couple of weeks down there in the first place. But Roycroft, the, the stuff really does play. Inning in two-thirds, three strikeouts, uh, goose eggs on the base runner count. ERA 2.37. Keep him here for a while, Cardinals. I think he's, uh, I don't know if he's the answer for leverage, man, but a game that you're leading and you're up by a few runs late to just be able to lock down and not have to use your closer, that's pretty good. Roy Croft is is one that I think can stick around for a little while with the way that he's been pitching. Let me know your thoughts, though, Cardinals fans, about the win, about where things stand for the team. They're five games up on 500 going into Monday afternoon. That's a 3 p.m. first pitch. A little bit weird to be playing out the rest of this series, but I guess it's associated with uh, 4th of July. I want to say maybe because the the Monday after the 4th is still a federal holiday. I don't know. They do some weird stuff in D.C., but the Cardinals will be back on Tuesday, Wednesday for a quick two-game series against the Royals at Bush before an exciting long weekend against the Cubbies as they'll play four games in three days between Friday, Saturday, Sunday at Bush. And then it's the All-Star break. So it's coming up quick. We got the announcements of the teams. Ryan Helsley is on the team. He's the only Cardinal that will be. Kind of weird because that might be the one guy that you would have said, and I and I did say last couple of days, would kind of be nice to see him get to rest over the All-Star break, but he's going to be part of the festivities and would maybe even pitch in the game. We'll see. Um, sometimes a manager can sort of talk to another manager that, that is managing the All-Star game and say, maybe don't use my guy, that sort of thing. But I think if Ryan Helsley is there, he certainly deserves the chance to get to pitch in the game. You don't know how many times you're going to get an opportunity to do that. Uh, for Helsley, it'll be number two, and I believe he did pitch the uh, the time in 2022, if memory serves. But that's what's going on. I'm going to wrap things up here, though. Appreciate you guys for listening, as always. Uh, let me know what I miss, and let me know, too, if you have ideas on who I should be talking about trade-wise for the Cardinals, those episodes, and maybe even bonus videos, uh, in addition to some of the daily stuff, will be coming hot and heavy here pretty soon. So thank you guys so much for listening. We'll talk to you next time on Be Shafe Daily. Peace.